Before I introduce Nicholas Deakin and ask him to open the session, let, I'd like to say something, as I did last week at his first lecture, about the genesis of these events, these sessions. They arise from conversations between myself and Sir Ronnie McIntosh, who is here, a very distinguished former civil servant. Both of us are in the position of having close relatives, in his case, his sister, in my case, my father, who joined the Communist Party from middle-class backgrounds in the 1930s. And I know that there are a number of others in the audience in a similar position. The simple motive for this inquiry, which we're very grateful to Nicholas Deacon for conducting and presenting to us, is the wish to understand. We want to try to answer the question of why so many young people, particularly in this case from middle class backgrounds, chose to join the Communist Party in the 1930s and why in contrast many, most, most others didn't do so. It's now over 70 years since they made these decisions, over 20 years since the end of the Cold War, which certainly affected earlier answers to that question. But it is, we hope, now possible to seek answers within a more balanced historical understanding of the period of the 1930s than was possible 20 or 30 years ago. You might say that this seminar is therefore self-indulgent um, or possibly redundant. After all, you might be saying again, why didn't Ronnie and myself ask our relatives why they joined the party? Of course we did, although we did so at times when political tensions before and after the Second World War and later were at their height, and certainly in my case, the answers, and I speak only for myself here, were not always entirely satisfying or satisfactory. But those conversations aren't really the point. What we're looking for is, is an historical, not a merely personal understanding of these events. We want to place the experience of our relations and friends um, within a much wider context. And we think that such an understanding may be of wide interest and that's indeed demonstrated by your attendance today. Last week, Nicholas began the inquiry with a splendid and wide-ranging discussion of the evidence, drawing on the experiences of some individuals, but placing them within this wider context of the impact of the First World War, pacifism, the rise of fascism, and above all, he emphasized Spain. This week, he will seek to analyze and to suggest some answers. And he'll be followed by contributions from the most distinguished panel whom we are honored to have with us today. And there'll then be an opportunity for questions and discussion after, as I said, a short break. Let me say a brief word about our speakers at this moment. Nicholas's career was in the civil service and local government before he became, from 1980 to 1998, Professor of Social Policy and Administration at the University of Birmingham. Juliet Gardner, a former editor, a very successful editor of History Today, and a writer and historian with a particular interest in 20th century Britain. Peter Hennessy, a member of the House of Lords, one of our foremost experts on the British civil service and government, Professor of Contemporary History at Queen Mary College, and we're proud to say a former Gresham Professor of Rhetoric. Finally, Dennis Healy, also, of course, member of the House of Lords, I don't really need to go on about him, former Defence Secretary, Chancellor of the Exchequer, Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, and to many of us, the leader whom the Labour Party should have had. We're most grateful to all of them for being here with us today. I'm now going to ask Nicholas to speak to us, and after that we will have some contributions from our panel. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Roderick, and welcome everyone this afternoon. Let me just say how I'm going to approach my task as the warm-up act. 
I'm going, first of all, to do a very brief summary of the first lecture that I gave a week ago. This time, I'm afraid, without illustrations. Secondly, I'm going to broaden the focus and move away from the small group on which I concentrated at Thursday's session and look at some motives for joining the Communist Party and some consequences of joining the Communist Party. I'm going to look at the choice made by these young middle-class recruits that Roderick's just been talking about, try to establish what the appeal was for them and also what was their appeal for the party. Then I'm going to say a little bit about popular front policies and practices of the Communist Party during the latter 30s. And finally, I'm going to try to draw some lessons. And they'll be very personal lessons, my experience from having worked a little bit in this area. And I hope that those conclusions will be helpful for the panel discussion that follows. So here, first of all, is the text to which I've been working. Why was it that communism was once regarded by many free, intelligent, well-informed people as the only hope for humanity? And that's from Ben Pimlott. In my attempt to answer that question, in the first lecture, I told the stories of some recruits, some eight, in fact, groups of recruits who made a commitment to communism. And I argued, as Sir Roderick has just done as well, that it's time for a fresh look, that the Communist Party and the USSR are both defunct, and that criticisms of communist recruits are essentially Cold War arguments. Now, the group I was talking about last week are not in any sense representative, but we're fortunate that we have in the work that Kevin Morgan and his colleagues at Manchester has done, a yardstick against such to measure the experience of the small group I talked about last week. And I said also last week that I was not going to talk about espionage. That's a separate topic and not one that I wish to be drawn into. And, and finally, again, as Sir Roderick said, uh, what we're doing here is not an apologia, I'm trying to give them their own voice. Now, I provided the general context last week, the Great War and its aftermath, the Depression, the rise of fascism in Europe. I went into the class background and family relationships of the group that I was talking about, and then I referred to their experience in secondary and higher education, especially Oxford. It's an accident that the group I was looking at did all go to Oxford. It prevented me from devoting the attention I perhaps should have done to Cambridge, which is very interesting at this period. And it meant I didn't talk about such interesting figures as James Klugman, but we can come to him in the course of the discussion. Then I gave a brief history, a very brief history of the Communist Party of Great Britain, and there's a little summary document on your seats if you want to refer to it. I talked about the development of the student left in Oxford. I talked about the Spanish Civil War. And I talked about the lives after joining the party of my group, the different forms that their commitment took, from active um, work for the party itself through to a range of activities that reflected their new communist loyalties. And finally, I questioned the awareness that this group had of criticisms of the Soviet Union. Such events as the famines in the Ukraine, the show trials in Moscow, the Gulag. This time, I want to take a wider look and look at the motives and consequences of this generation. And there are, I would say, a variety of routes into wishing to join the Communist Party. And there's a very simple basic one, and that's reading the Marxist-Leninist classics. If you look at the autobiographies from the period, several of those who joined the party described this as a very straightforward process. They simply read the books uh, made the analysis and took the necessary step of joining the party. Then, almost equally simple as an explanation, is the immediate economic and political context. Here, from a rather corrupt source, one would say, is a minute that I picked up by an MI5 case officer in 1951. He was reviewing the incidents of communism in the 30th student generation. And he said, I quote, the economic depression at home, 
and the rise of fascism in Germany gave the communist movement a powerful attraction for many of the brighter undergraduates. Obvious, clear, straightforward. Even more straightforward, here's Doris Lessing, a member of the Communist Party, in retrospect in 1947. She says simply, it was the desperations of slump time. Another simple explanation, and this comes from the interviews that Margot Kettle did with her contemporaries in the 80s, simply, it was Spain. But in some cases, you had to have an animation of that process. It had to develop. I talked last week about the courtship that communist recruiters undertook, and I gave you an example of that, because the family correspondence has been kept. The courtship that Moira Lind experienced in the early 30s from uh, a friend, a close friend, who wished to recruit her to the Communist Party, and the stages through which he talked her in the process of joining. There were those, sometimes pushed aside as sentimental socialists, who were easily persuadable by events. You trace again, again, and again in the literature the impact that the hunger marchers made as they passed through the university towns. Instant conversion on experiencing at first hand the human suffering exemplified by the hunger marchers. Another simplified explanation is class guilt, that these were middle class people guilty about their relative degree of protection from the impact of the depression. I think this is more likely to be class ignorance than class guilt. Uh, Christopher Mayhew, in his very interesting autobiography, talks about his lack of understanding of the working class. He knew they were out there, he knew they were exploited, he knew that capitalism was responsible for this, but he couldn't feel any human contact. He didn't understand on a day-to-day -day human basis what their experience was. Then among the other simple explanations, there's adolescent rebellion, rejection of your parents and family, moving away from your family by making a drastic step of joining the party. Kingsley Amos is very unreliable memoirs, example of that. He says, it, it was simply my banal desire to shock my father. But in my group, the family environment was often quite sympathetic, quite sympathetic to uh, the gifted children wishing to make an important step um, forward from liberalism, as Stephen Spender put it, that was a, a kind of a progression that many parents and families could understand and respond to. And then finally, and I talked about this last week, there were experiences during education. And I believe that the influence of charismatic teachers has perhaps been understated, important to pick out the contribution that they make, and also the way in which uh, intelligent students worked up around the theme of anti-militarism to start off with, rejection of the military training and the officers' training corps, a strong bonding influence, but also more broadly building up an alternative narrative, which you see in one or two schools during this period. And then, of course, the, the universities. Now, there were appeals of the general kind which might make people in this generation sympathetic to the notion of joining the Communist Party. They could see communism as the best way of resisting fascism at home. The menace exemplified in Mosley, now seen as a figure of fun, but then genuinely menacing with some support, support briefly in the press, the Daily Mail, support from rich businessmen, a potential fascist leader of a threatening character. So communism is the way of resisting fascism, resisting Mosley, obviously an appealing line. Admiration for the achievements of the Soviet Union, sometimes mediated through a disposition to admire Russian culture and society. Communism seen as an international movement, transcending national divisions, now exemplified in the Soviet Union as the socialist sixth of the world to pick up the Red Dean of Canterbury's little slogan, but next, wider still. Communism as modernism in arts and technology, the appeal of the Soviet cinema. I showed one or two pictures of that last week. Communism as comradeship, transcending nationalism and race, and communism as resistance to imperialism and colonialism. That, I think, is something that is understated now, underemphasized the importance of the role that communism played in providing a narrative for those coming to this country from the colonies, from the empire, and gave them a 
consistent feeling of support in their struggle against imperialism. And, and finally, communists themselves seen as tough, well-informed, committed people. Then uh, individual encounters, meeting persuasive, charismatic people who could present convincing, confident argument to persuade you to take the step. And there are, of course, also close friendships, so important in any student generation, and sexual relationships. And perhaps to summarize that, a sense that, I quote, the current of history, which flows in one direction only, flowed the way they were going. This is the poet Kathleen Raine, in retrospect, talking about her former husband, Charles Madge, and his coterie of intelligent Wickhamists. So after the mid-1930s, all this starts to come together in an apparently coherent and attractive package, as the slogan of the time had it, against fascism and war, and of course, the national government as well. But in choosing the Communist Party, and so Roderick made this point too, in choosing the Communist Party, there were alternatives. If you were anti-war, you could be a pacifist. Many people in that generation were pacifists. There was a strength of feeling about the rejection of war, um, not now, I think, fully understood. And pacifism drew on a strength of feeling which was reflected in the famous peace ballot, which was conducted at this time in the mid-1930s, and the peace pledge union set up by the charismatic clergyman Dick Shepherd, which invited people to reject war and never take part in any armed conflict again. The League of Nations, now in retrospect seen as a failed project, at the time still attracting a remarkable degree of loyalty and support. There was a powerful lobby, a popular lobby, a parliamentary lobby in favour of the League, making the case for common action for collective security. Or if you were wishing to stress against fascism, there were other parties of the left who were also against fascism. There was the Independent Labour Party, there was the left wing of the Labour Party, rising young politicians like Young Nye Bevan. Uh, there were the Liberals, still a power in the land, although divided, fatally divided at parliamentary level. At uh, a popular level and in student level, the Liberals were still a presence. There were pressure groups you could join, the National Council for Civil Liberties. And after 1936, there was the Left Book Club and its satellite local groups, penetrated but not dominated by the Communist Party. And then there was a difficulty in choosing to join, perhaps, about the nature of the party itself. Because during the period from 1928, the Communist Party was undergoing a process of identifying itself as a British, Bolshevik, vanguard, working class party. This is the class against class period when the communists issued harsh denunciations of the Labour Party and the trade union movement, denouncing them in some cases as social fascists. This communist party was a working class party, but at the same time it wasn't the party of the working class because that was still Labour. So why does the communist party want middle class recruits. It had had a few, but only a scattering of individuals in the 1920s, some of them very important, like Palm Dutt, or another example, Ivor Montague, whom I very much wanted to work in last week but couldn't find space for. There were individuals, talented and important individuals, but there was no systematic attempt to recruit from the middle classes. But then you get the change of policy. You get the Comintern abandoning class against class by stages, 1934 and then formally in 1935. So the Communist Party in Britain opens negotiations with other parties. First of all with the ILP, the Independent Labour Party, until recently denounced as social fascists. It starts to build alliances with progressive elements in the bourgeoisie and with their children. And I trace that process a little bit in the eccentric but fascinating career of comrade Prince Mirsky. And then you get the famous intervention, which I quoted last week, but will quote again, by Willie Gallagher, shortly to be a communist MP in 1935, 
comes to Cambridge and what he says is this, we want people who are capable, who are good scientists and historians and teachers. It doesn't follow at all that you will be good workers. We need you as you are. If you have a vocation, it's pointless to run away to factories. We want you to study and become good students. And the party used consciously students to make links with other progressive elements in what you might call, was called at the time, popular frontism. Because as a very good, strong example of popular front action in student political organisation, the step the party took, the Federation of Socialist Students, their communist network, to unite with the university's labour federation. This is one of the few examples in the mid-1930s of the Labour Party permitting such a fusion between left and far left. But there are other forms of direct action of a popular front character taken by students. Action against war and also campaigning against rearmament. That's a powerful factor in the campaigning uh, list of issues during the mid-1930s, left-wing organisations campaigning against rearming. For the League of Nations, the League of Nations is acceptable now as far as the Communist Party is concerned because the USSR has joined the League, Nazi Germany have left. So action, popular front action in favour of the League of Nations, very acceptable. Um, and then anti-fascist action above all Spain. So much comes back to Spain, Spain as an issue and Spain as a practical means of demonstrating popular front commitment. A whole wide range of activities that could be undertaken. Now, the party also trades on recruits going the extra mile for the revolution. First of all, to capture student organisations by open campaigning, electing people on communist tickets. John Savile says that in the LSE in the late 1930s, all, virtually all, the student organisations at LSE had either communist chairmen or communist secretaries, and they were known communists. But the party also promoted clandestine membership, clandestine membership of student and anti-war groups, non-declared communists nonetheless occupying positions in political and social bodies on student campuses. And this was justified. It was justified as popular frontism in action. If the Labour Party wouldn't formally go along with popular front activities, infiltrate Labour Party organisations and make sure that they do things that are sympathetic and consistent with the popular front agenda. And in so doing, they were helped by the manifest commitment that communists brought to these tasks. As Kevin Morgan, I think, rather nicely puts it, Hardly a committee could get going without a contingent of youthful communists turning up as moles or volunteers. So you get by the, towards the end of the 30s, you get a whole series of international student bodies, peace forums, League of Nations unions, all thoroughly, thoroughly penetrated. And in carrying out that task of penetration, communist students inevitably attracted the attention of the security services. Just give you two quick examples there. The anti-war movement. When Frank Mayer, whom I introduced to you last week, American uh, communist student, deported in 1934, when he was responsible for organising anti-war efforts across the various student campuses in Britain, he was under quite close surveillance from, from Special Branch. And that interests me because it demonstrates that anti-war activity was seen as subversive from a very early period. Another of my subjects last week, Jack Gaster, uh, was under surveillance from 1932 onwards when he was a member of the Independent Labour Party. And Special Branch clearly thought, saw the ILP in a rather different way to the rest of the, the country. The rest of the country saw the ILP as a rather ineffectual left-wing kind of socialist vegetarian organisation of the kind that George Orwell detested so and de denounced that kind of socialism. Special Branch and MI5 saw the ILP as deeply sinister and therefore Jack Gaster as one of its prominent figures. He later joined the Communist Party but he was still in the ILP when Special Branch was surveying him. They saw him as a potentially dangerous, even revolutionary figure. Now, I know Lord Hennessy is going to say something about this, so I won't develop the point very much, but uh, my reading of the surveillance operation that Special Branch and MI5 ran was that it was amateurish, 
profoundly ignorant about politics sometimes and very disagreeably anti-Semitic. It's a very painful, nasty experience to read those 30 files, 30s files with the kind of reflections on the Jewish character of these agitators. And at some point in the later 30s, perhaps someone knows the answer to this, special branch officers were asked, attending left-wing communist meetings, that were asked to estimate how many Jews are present. So the special branch officer signs off with, and I estimate that 20 Jews were present. The only substantial information that you find on the student movement in the files comes later on. It comes after the Second World War from what I've called rather melodramatically turncoats. People who had experience in the 30s repented of it and decided to tell um, MI5 about what they'd done. And it's quite striking contrast between what MI5 knew then and what in the 30s and what they came to know in the 1940s. That sort of surveillance was obviously tedious and it had all the flaws that I just described, but it wasn't in itself physically threatening, though that did come later. Because unlike continental communist parties, the CPGB members could combine membership of the party and their professional activities without fear of stigma, although that too eventually changed. Finally, membership of the party and commitment to communism was in some cases quite brief. Uh, Dennis Healy has a comment that in 1930s, late 1930s, the communism was a bed and breakfast party. But in others, it was a lifelong commitment, were only given up with great difficulty at moments of traumatic change for the party. Let me finish by drawing some very brief personal conclusions. First of all, I would say that there is no question but that this generation, collectively, cared about the issues of the day, the political and economic issues. This seems admirable. On the other hand, there was a weakness. And here's a quotation from Christopher Isherwood, which I'll read to you. I know I was supposed to feel. I know what it was fashionable for my generation to feel. We cared about everything. Fascism in Germany and Italy, the seizure of Manchuria, Indian nationalism, then the Irish question, the workers, the Negroes, the Jews. We spread our feelings over the whole world, and I know that mine was spread very thin. And that, in a way, I think is, makes it clear why Spain was so particularly important, because it provided a focus. It provided a focus for action, ranging at one extreme from joining the International Brigade, from ambulance driving, from nursing, fundraising for medical aid and refugee children, and campaigning to change the government's policy on non-intervention. Spain became the good cause of the decade, and one on which communists could campaign and recruit without inhibition alongside other progressives. However, in joining the party, communist recruits relinquished at least some of their critical faculties. They'd seen an image of the radiant future, whether literally in the case of those who went to the USSR, or at least in principle. Proper study of Marxist-Leninist texts set out an inevitable progression. It was the wave of the future, as one of them said, and although the journeys might represent difficulty, the destination was not in doubt. This seems to be, in part, I think, one reason why the events of the 30s that might have given them pause for thought did not have much impact on the group. I refer to the treason trials, to the gulag, to the episode of Pum in Spain, and the obsessional after that chasing of Trotskyists. Only the Nazi-Soviet pact in 1939 and the party's enforced embrace then of, quotes, revolutionary defeatism gave some of them pause for thought. But there was another side to this surrender of the to the authority of the party and the democratic centralism of its decision taking, as in the change of line in 1939. There was also reassurance to be found in membership of a disciplined organisation and in the comradeship across any class differences of party members. As the CPGB liked to say, there was no rank and file in the party. That meant equal shares in the tasks and the rewards 
of participating in joint endeavours for common goals. Comradeship transcended national boundaries and gave the British comrades ready access to help when meeting fellow communists abroad and impelled them in turn to make positive responses to the situation of foreign or overseas communists in Britain, whether exiles from Nazi Germany and Austria or from different parts of the British Empire. As the anthem put it, the Internationale unites the human race. The cultural mission of the British Party after the end of the class against class period also produced some worthwhile outcomes. There was a response to the Comintern insistence that national parties should rediscover what was useful in the radical past histories of their own countries. The various different cultural activities pushed forward by the party in art, architecture, theatre, cinema, were often vigorous and effective and not always crude agitprop. Party literature became far more appealing both in presentation and content. Festivals, mass spectacles organised by party members encouraged popular participation. Nevertheless, the achievements of the party during the 30s, to which some middle class recruits did make significant contributions, must be seen as modest. The industrial wing of the party, in which they were only marginal invo marginally involved, made some progress, but political gains outside the little Moscows of South Wales and Fife, and perhaps Hampstead, were not great. The CPGB, far from being a mass party, was at best, as Harry Pollitt liked to see it, the militant wing of the broader Labour movement. Only the broader Labour movement obstinately refused to accept it as such. And finally, the can, and I think should be, no doubt, that the communism that this group adopted was based on an illusion not just because the intellectual foundations on which it was built were unsound, but because the structures that were erected by Soviet communists on them and imposed on the member parties of the Comintern were not liberating, but confining. The young middle-class recruits of the 1930s cannot be blamed for not anticipating the dire consequences of Stalinism in the post-war world but they can properly be reproached for not acknowledging what many of their contemporaries could see, that the seeds of totalitarianism were always present. If that seems like a negative note to join on, I would like to end on, I would like to add that for me to encounter at first hand the idealism of this small group and through them the wider generation was in many respects a very positive experience. If not the absolute brightest and best, they were somewhere close to it. And it's difficult to avoid making some parallels with later generations of young idealists, the peace campaigners and CND, perhaps even more recent groups of anti-capitalism protesters attempting to address another world economic crisis. But that's outside my brief and I'll leave it to others to pursue if they wish to do so. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>